So uh, I, I thought a good place to start is to talk about intellectual property and how do we protect the right stuff. And what I'm going to do is, because I know that a lot of the folks out there are students, um, I, th I thought I'd talk a little bit about how I got to do what I do. Um, I grew up in Los Gatos. Um, my family moved here in 1973 when the biggest business in downtown San Jose was tomato cans. In my backyard, there were uh, cherry orchards, which are now multi-million dollar estates. Um, and I saw Silicon Valley grow. Uh, one of the things I'm very proud of in, in, my, in what I do for a living is that I learned how to talk Silicon Valley when the Silicon Valley language would be developed. So I want to talk a little bit about how, uh, what my background is. I want to talk a little bit about intellectual property. And then we're going to kind of end with a couple questions about, are we protecting the right stuff? And so, what I describe what I do for a living is I change the world one lawsuit at a time. Uh, I deal with really complicated questions, and normally my clients have a particular view of the way they think the world should work in a particular way. And sometimes the courts, the legal systems, the things that we're dealing with, um, they don't completely understand what the particular visions are, and there are competing visions. And there's decisions to be made, not only about what's lawful and unlawful, but what's the right thing from a social perspective. Um, I've actually litigated the question of, can you sell a duck on eBay? <laughs> and it may sound like a really trivial, stupid thing, but when eBay first was founded and they started selling pest dispensers, people really didn't know what you could do or couldn't do on eBay. And part of my job was to help eBay define a set of rules through which they could operate their business and grow into the powerhouse that it is today. But back then, there were no rules. If you look on eBay today, they have a series of rules that kind of say, here's what you can sell, here's what you can't sell. You can't sell a nuclear guidance system, for example. And a lot of those original ones in the very early days were actually written by me. So who am I? <laughs> Uh, well, one of the things about me is that I'm a trial lawyer, and I work in a, at a very large law firm. It's about over a thousand lawyers, and inside my group, which is the intellectual property group, there are about 125 spread around the world. The way I describe myself is I protect and I defend companies who have major technology disputes. And at the end of the day, I save companies, I protect innovation, and I ensure open and fair competition. And that's really what I do, because I don't think Silicon Valley can operate without these sorts of things occurring. So how did I get here? As I said before, I grew up in Silicon Valley. Uh, most people say, oh, you know, to be an IP lawyer, you've got to be a really smart guy and be able to do everything, and, you know, was probably doing calculus. And, in, in kindergarten. <laughs> and uh, I didn't learn how to read until third grade. Um, I'm dyslexic. Um, I have a reading disability, and I practice law. Uh, I went to Dartmouth for undergrad. My uh, school advisor told me not to apply to any Ivy League institution because she said that I, she didn't think I'd be able to get in. And I said I disagreed because I felt like I was a leader in the community, that I had done things that other people hadn't done before, and I was going to try, and I got an early admission. And when I got in, I went and I gave her a copy of that acceptance. <laughs> I went to Vanderbilt for law school. Uh, Vanderbilt's a school in Nashville, Tennessee. I hate country music, in case you're wondering. <laughs> and uh, Vanderbilt, uh, I went there really because at the time I went to law school, I was a top-rated morning DJ. And I got into a copyright fight as part of my radio responsibilities. And Vanderbilt had a very good copyright program. And, more importantly, they let me in. <laughs> After uh, I went to Vanderbilt, I worked for two judges. Uh, one judge was the Colorado Supreme Court, and another one was a judge in San Jose. I don't have a technical degree. A lot of people think that to do high technology lawsuits, you have to be a PhD in electrical engineering or have some sort of advanced technical background. I actually think my value as a trial lawyer is the fact that I don't understand this stuff. Because I am typically talking to judges and juries who are lay people. And, uh, and if I don't understand a technical concept, there ain't no way other people are going to be able to understand it. 
And the thing that is really the key to my success <laughs> is that it may not be obvious to all of you, but I am in fact very handsome. <laughs> And for those of you that are unsure about it, I'd be happy to give you my business card. <laughs> because my business card actually says that I am a partner and a very handsome man. <laughs> so let's turn now to how do we protect intellectual property. So intellectual property is protected first by the Constitution. And one of the great privileges in my job is I get to celebrate the Constitution every day I go to work. And there's two sections of the Constitution that matter. The first one is the one I have up here, which is Article One, Section 8. And when the Constitution was passed, in the very first article, the very first thing they wrote, in Section 8, they said, we are going to protect intellectual property because it is fundamental to America. And we are going to protect both the things that authors do, which are creative works like movies, songs, things like that. And we're going to protect inventions. Because it is fundamentally American to innovate and create. The other part that I, I get to celebrate that I, that I don't have up here <coughs> is the Seventh Amendment to the Constitution, which says people who have civil disputes are entitled to a trial by jury. It is the greatest form of democracy because Jurors have to reach a unanimous decision together on who's right, who's wrong, who's telling the truth, who isn't. So every day I get, to privilege, I get the privilege to celebrate being an American just because I get to deal with two fundamental constitutional guidelines that go back to the beginning of our country. So what is intellectual property? Intellectual property can fall into many different categories, but fundamentally, they're not four. The one that we hear about most in Silicon Valley is patents. Some people like patents, some people don't like patents, but fundamentally they're patents. And that's one of the things covered by Article 1, Section 8. Those are typically things that are useful, that are new. So they're the new ways of doing things or new things you made. The second are copyrights. Copyrights tend to be more artistic expression, pictures, movies, songs, trademarks, Coca-Cola logos, things that you kind of recognize and they have brands or advertising. And then trade secrets. Trade secrets are uh, confidential information. The secret recipe for Coke. KFC secret recipe, although people don't seem to want to enjoy that as much now as they used to. Um, but these are all forms of intellectual property because they don't actually have boundaries that are easily defined in a physical sense. So you have to figure out other ways to define what those boundaries. So the goal of intellectual property at the end of the day is to encourage new art and invention in exchange for letting people make a buck off. You want to make sure that we're encouraging this behavior so people can make some money off it. So there's a return for the investment and the effort that they make. Now, we have a whole system of governance. We have a whole system of intellectual property. But we don't, as a society, spend a lot of time stepping back and saying, is the way that we're going about protecting this stuff actually working? So the studies have said it is working. If you look at some of the statistics that I have here, IP is an important part of the United States economy, no question about it. 55.7 million jobs are IP intensive for a country that's roughly 320 million people. That's a lot of jobs. $5.8 trillion in U.S. output, and IP makes up 38% of the gross domestic product. 74% of the U.S. exports are tied to intellectual property. It's enormous numbers, right? I still may answer the question though, is, is this actually, are we actually protecting the stuff that really drives the economy? So, let's take a look at an example. For those of you who don't recognize this man, this is Albert Einstein. Mm -hmm. Now, Albert Einstein, I think all of you would recognize, is the best known for E equals MC squared. And that is called a discovery. Now, you might remember from the Article 1, Section 8, it says in the Constitution that you can protect discoveries. It turns out the Patent Act that the United States have doesn't protect discoveries. You cannot get a patent on E equals MC squared, the single most important 
discovery or piece of science that Albert Einstein disclosed to the world. On the other hand, one of the things that Albert Einstein did patent was a refrigerator design. In the canons of history, no one will ever remember that Albert Einstein patented a refrigerator design. Do we really think that having a patent law that covers it one way or another would have stopped Albert Einstein from doing the things that he did? And I'm not going to answer that question for you. I just throw that out there as, as a question of, do, do the IP laws work and are we seeking to protect the right things? I think all of us would agree e equals mc squared is the more valuable of the two things associated with science that Albert Einstein did. So who's our greatest uh, American inventor? I have over here uh, Ben Franklin. Ben Franklin is known to be a prolific inventor in American history, one of the greatest ones ever. Not once did he ever file for a patent. The reason he didn't file for a patent is because most of his inventions predated the Constitution. And back then, when you had your original 13 colonies, if you wanted to get a patent, you had to go to each and every one of the 13 colonies and file a bunch of paperwork to get your, your patents. And he decided that was too much of a hassle. Alexander Graham Bell, uh, he, he had a couple of patents. But the two people that were most interesting are these two over on the edge. And I don't know if you recognize them, but they're Orville and Wilbur Wright. They're the people who invented the earth. And it turns out they were also two of the people to most aggressively assert their patents to stop other airplane companies from coming in and manufacturing airplanes in competition with them. And it was only when, I forget which one died first, but it was only when the first one died that they stopped enforcing their patents. But it drove their company for years. Now my personal feeling is, one of the most prolific inventors in American history is Wild E. Coyote. And those of you <laughs> Who are older, you know who Wile E. Coyote is, and for those of you who are younger, uh, you might not, but he is a well-known <coughs> character that was always trying to, ch to chase the roadrunner. I've listed here some of his inventions, but I think anyone who's watched any of the Wile E. Coyote cartoons recognizes that while he might have been a very profound and brilliant inventor, he was a total and complete failure. So he might have had lots and lots of patents covering these wonderful designs of his, but none of them ever worked out. Then we can fast forward to the current day. A lot of you probably watch Shark Tank. We have Kevin O'Leary, uh, who's the bald guy on, on the left, and Mark Cuban uh, on the right. And if you watch Shark Tank, there's an interesting discussion about intellectual property that comes up in nearly every episode. Mark Cuban comes in and he says, anyone who knows me knows I'm not a fan of patent troll. Patent trolls are people that sue people with patents for money, or they have patents and they sue other companies for money, and they make nothing. This is actually, there are only a few areas in which I'm a fan of patents at all. On the other hand, you have Kevin O'Leary who says, let's see, there's nothing proprietary about what you are doing. Nothing stops me from doing the exact same thing and squashing you like the bug that you are. And every episode, he either says bug or cockroach, those words are <laughs> And at the end of the day, you have a very violent debate that's happening in the common discourse every Friday night about does it really matter to have something proprietary or not. And at the end of the day, regardless of whether someone feels it's proprietary or not, they may secure a good amount of funding for that. The interesting thing about Mark Cuban, he funded uh, an organization called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, which is a nonprofit with the Mark Cuban Endowed Chair to combat stupid patents. At the same time, last week it was announced, he's actually asserting patents against some retailers. And so even Mark Cuban has kind of the good mark and the bad mark, not sure which one's which, but even he internally in his own mind can't decide how he feels about the protecting the proprietary inventions. So what does this mean for all of you? Well, what it means for all of you from my perspective is that in many ways it's better to win the race than to lose the race and ask for a piece of the medal. First thing is, 
Coming up with a great idea to do something new and useful is really the ticket to success. And I, I actually agree with the previous speaker that failing along the way is essential because you can't make something great without learning the steps along the way. Two, protect it carefully. It's better to have protection than not. And three, it's better to win in the marketplace in the courtroom. Now, I might be doing myself a disservice as far as my own business, but I actually believe it's better to win in the marketplace than in the courtroom. So with that, I want to turn, oops, I, think, I think one of my slides is missing. Well, I'll tell you about one, I thought it was in there, but I'll tell you about one thing, and then I'm going to uh, kind of conclude with it, which is, uh, you've heard about the social network and, uh, and, and, and my involvement in that case. I was the lead counsel for Mark Zuckerberg and Facebook in that case. Now, I can't comment a lot publicly about uh, the details of that case, but at its heart, the Winklevoss brothers, at the end of the day, at the very end of the case, what they said was, look, we had an idea, and you took it. And what Mark Zuckerberg's response was, it wasn't your idea, and I built this company with my bare hands. And what the courts were asked to do is to figure out who's right and who's wrong, and what's it worth. And the interesting thing about it is the law doesn't always recognize the bare hands part of it. It's called the sweat of the brow doctrine. And the law doesn't always recognize the economic value of having a good idea and actually executing upon it in a meaningful way. Now, Facebook heavily disputed that, that any idea ever came from the Lincoln Boss Brothers and, and that they, they, their idea was really something quite different about dating students uh, on the Harvard campus or looking for jobs with other Harvard people. But setting that aside, the fact that the law doesn't necessarily reflect the ability of people or the need for people or the value that people present to actually exploit the invention, to bring it to market, to make people look the lives better, and instead focuses on the more naked piece of paper without any actual sweat of the brow occurring something that I think deserves a lot more public discourse than is already in. So that's the last thought I, I want you to leave you with is, it's great to have a great idea, but isn't it also really important to value what people do with it? With that, I think I'll open myself up to questions that I know some people are probably answering in on other Saturday.